Good morning. Welcome to Go Church Online. We're glad that you're joining us today. Weird times uh, call for weird measures. So here we are we're having church and uh, from my home to yours, my living room to your living room. And we just hope you can find a way to, to adjust and let God speak because he is not limited to location and he can speak to you today. Uh, hopefully he already has been um, today in your, in your own time with him this morning. And hopefully he will continue to speak to you um, right there in your living room or your car or wherever you are. Um, in just a moment, Connor's going to sing some songs when he does, uh, and Christy's going to help him. And when they do, I hope you'll be able to sing along if you sing, or if, uh, if not, just um, in spirit, you know, just uh, spend some time praying through those songs and, and, and communing with God because we need that. So glad you're here today. Connor's going to lead us in some music. Welcome. Glad you're with us. You are who you say you are. You will do what you say you'll do. You'll be who you've always been to us, Jesus. Our hope is in you alone. Our strength in your mighty name. Our peace in the darkest day remains, Jesus. This we know, we will see the enemy run. This we know, we will see the victory come. We hold on to every promise you ever made. Jesus, you are unfailing. Our joy in the heaviness Our way when it seems there is no way Jesus This we know We will see the enemy run This we know we will see the victory come We hold on to every promise you ever made Jesus, you are unfailing We trust you, we trust you Your ways higher than our own Jesus, we trust you, we trust you, your ways are higher than our own. We trust you, we trust you, your ways are higher than our own. Jesus, we trust you. We trust you, your ways are higher than our own. This we know, we will see the enemy run. This we know, we will see the victory come. We hold on to every promise you ever made. Jesus, you are unfailing. Jesus, you are unfailing. Jesus, you are unfailing. Sometimes it's hard to know anything for certain these days, so it helps to proclaim what we do know, and we know that amidst this crisis and um, 
just <laughs> world event that's taking place that no matter what, Jesus is going to come back, that the enemy is going to be defeated, um, that our eternity is already is already written as believers. Um, so as we continue to worship this morning, um, let's just think about what Jesus has done and what he's going to do um, and let that impact every single aspect of our lives. say thy strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in whole Jesus paid it all all to him I hold sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power in thine own. Spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus bid you roll. Oh, to him I hold. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. the throne I stand in incomplete Jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin that left Crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. from the dead oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead, Jesus. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin I left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow.
Well, amen. I don't know about you, but I need that. I need that singing. I need to hear the songs. I mean, God has been working uh, in my heart through music so much lately, and thankfully we have um, gifted musicians who can help us to use that gift of God in music and, and lead us before the throne. And, and God just uses it in a powerful way, uh, in an emotional way, which He made us emotional. He is emotional. He has passion. And He made us that way in His image. So it's always wonderful to worship God through music. Well, I told myself that I would never take the quick and easy path and title a sermon with some combination of the year 2020 and the word vision. It's just too easy. But as you can see, I have broken my own rule. It seems some things are simply unavoidable. Before I dig into Scripture today, I want to simply tell you that I believe the Bible is alive. This is not only a history book or an academic book to be studied in an academic kind of way, but it is also a spiritually living book. It's used in powerful and inexplicable ways by the Holy Spirit. For example, I believe a passage that was written about ancient Israel might also be intended by God to be heard in a personal way by people in 2020. Maybe even that someone in one time and place would hear something more specific from the Spirit than someone in another time and place. Not something incongruent with the original intent, but perhaps a different kind of application for a different circumstance. I am fully convinced that God led my wife first and me second to an Old Testament passage which is written prophetically about the church as a whole, and by the Spirit, God spoke to us about Go Church, specifically. And we shared about this with our original core team before we launched, and we've shared about it in membership classes, but I have not yet shared this in a public sermon. Today, I am going to pull back the curtain for the rest of you. What happened is this. Just a little over two years ago, I had just taken my leap of faith to plant Go Church. I had resigned from the large, healthy church where I was pastor with the full intention of following the Lord to plant a church from scratch in Ridgefield. We had not yet begun our core team meetings. We were still in the process of inviting a few families to join the mission. Christy and I decided we needed a break between churches, and we spent about a month in the home of my parents in Missouri. It so happens that our daughter Tori was back from the mission field during that time, so she was there with us. Now, keep in mind that we are in a faith-filled, adventurous moment. We don't know for sure where our salary is going to come from. We are still finding people to join us on this crazy quest to start a new church. In other words, I'm in my element, pumped up and excited, while my wife is scared to death. To be fair, this woman has followed me off numerous cliffs. She has plenty of faith, but she does like reassurance from the Lord. On top of this, as is often the case, after we had stepped out on faith, God had removed our crutches in some pretty painful ways, and that left Christy especially desperate to get just one more go-ahead from God. If I'm honest, I needed it too. So one night, there in my parents' house, Christy thought she heard Tori call her name from upstairs. She went up to Tori's room, but Tori said, Mom, I, I didn't call you. The next night, she thought she heard Tori knocking at the door. She got up and went to the door, but Tori wasn't there. The third night, Tori was sleeping on the floor in our room because others had taken her room upstairs, and Christy thought she heard Tori call her name. Tori said, Mom, I didn't call you. Christy immediately thought of the Bible story with Samuel and Eli. And if you recall, Eli, Eli told Samuel to say what? Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So guess what she did? She went out to the living room with her Bible and said, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Now, just by the way, my wife has a walk with God to be envied, okay? She makes me jealous with her walk. 
I just can't spend that much time with the Lord. She's a prayer warrior and a true follower of Jesus. And so when she prayed to hear from God, she did what every super mature follower of Jesus does, and she just broke open her Bible at random. And we laugh, but I've seen God speak that way more than once. If the disciples rolled dice to figure out who was going to be the 12th apostle, I mean, so she, she did that. She opened her Bible, and it opened to Ezekiel 17, 22 through 24. These verses were set off on the page as a quotation from God, and so her eyes were drawn just to these verses in the middle of the night. The next morning, Christy told me all about it, and she said, I get from this passage that God is going to plant this church. But I'm curious what you think about the rest of it. I just about exploded with understanding. It was almost like God showed her the verse and gave me the understanding so that we could come together on it as a team. So here are the words that Christy read that night and showed me the next morning. Ezekiel 17, 22 through 24. Thus says the Lord God, I will also take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and set it out. I will pluck from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one, and I will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the high mountain of Israel I will plant it, that it may bring forth boughs and bear fruit and become a stately cedar. And birds of every kind will nest under it. They will nest in the shade of its branches. All the trees of the field will know that I am the Lord. I bring down the high tree, exalt the low tree, dry up the green tree, and make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will perform it. Now, before we dig into this, I want to tell you that it absolutely matters greatly who the original audience was and what God's original intent was. There is a principle of biblical interpretation that says the text will never mean what it never meant. This is a helpful principle as long as one remembers that application is where the Holy Spirit really does His work. At one point, at the point of application, there may be some different ways that God speaks to you through Scripture, depending on what He's doing in the world and in your life. Some of biblical academia might disagree with me right now, but this is not their classroom. To their point, though, it is true that we cannot make passages of Scripture mean whatever we want them to mean. You should be careful about saying, well, what it means to me is, we should always remember that what it means is what it means, period. And yet again, I'm saying that at the point of application, the Holy Spirit may use Scripture in different ways at different times with different people. In our case, God led us to a passage that was written about the church as a whole, and we believe God led us to apply it to our own church in a special way. Should all churches apply it this way? I really don't know. I just believe God woke Christy up in the night and gave me an understanding of what he showed her that amounts to a very specific vision for Go Church. What it means is what it means. But how we feel led to apply it is the way God used it in our lives, personally. In other words, since this passage is a promise about the church as a whole, in receiving it also as a promise from God for Go Church, we are not ignoring the original intent but rather are simply applying that intent more specifically, believing that God brought us to it by His Spirit in order to speak into our lives. I will add that while we accept unequivocally what this passage means universally, we hold on more loosely to what we have taken it to mean specifically. In case you didn't follow that, let me put it more simply like this. God's universal promises are always true, while our specific application of those promises may need adjustment. Taking the current text as our example, I'm saying this. I believe God's promise presented here through the prophet Ezekiel is a universal promise about the church of Jesus Christ. I also believe God used that promise to show us some very specific things regarding his vision for Go Church. 
Now, if we prove to be wrong about our specific application of this passage, we will not be ashamed in having spent our lives in the direction of fulfilling this dream, a dream which is also perfectly in line with the general calling that we all have from the Great Commission, the call to make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to obey the commands of Christ. So without further prelude, let's break this passage into bite-sized pieces and chew through it. Verse 22, Thus says the Lord God, I will also take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and set it out. First, notice that God, Yahweh, is the one speaking. All of Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for instruction, 2 Timothy 3.16. However, not all Scripture is a direct quotation from God, as is this passage. God is speaking here, and He is telling us what He is going to do. Using metaphorical or prophetic language, God says, I will take a sprig from the top of the cedar and set it out. Now, what I'm going to do with each phrase of our text is tell you first what is meant universally and then tell you what I believe God is saying about our specific church plant. So first, the universal message is this of this first phrase. God is going to launch the church from the royal line of David. Now, that statement comes from a lot of unpacking, and I'm not going to spend most of my time doing that sort of thing today. But if you read a commentary, you're going to find something along those lines. The idea from Ezekiel here is that a new day is coming wherein God is going to send a Messiah king, a branch, who will be broken off from the top, having descended from the kingly tribe of Judah and specifically the royal line of King David. And God is going to set this person apart and start something not only new, but better through him. The original cedar is Israel, and the planting of the Lord taken from the top of that cedar is the church. This passage is all about Jesus, but it is even more about his church, which, remember, continues to function as his body on earth. The church is the manifestation of Jesus on earth from the time of his ascension into heaven forward. Ezekiel is prophesying about the coming Messiah, or Christ, and also about the church, which he will plant and leave behind. Understand this prediction was written down hundreds of years before it happened. We look back to the founding of the church through Christ, but Ezekiel was looking forward to it and predicting it. Now, given that I also believe God brought us to this passage to help form a vision for Go Church, what do I take this to mean specifically? Here it is. God will launch Go Church from the top of a larger church. Now, there's more to it than that, but this is what fits into a sentence neatly. Remember that when we received this as being a promise from the Lord, we had not done anything yet. Actually, we had been broken off, but we had not yet been planted. And so at the time, we took this as encouragement, a promise. Why? Because our situation at that moment made it feel like this was about us. As the original church started from scratch from the top of a much larger group known as Judaism, so we were starting from a larger established church, but there's even more to it than that. Understand that most pastors don't leave large churches to start a new church. It it almost never happens. I'm not sure I've ever personally seen it, and I know hundreds of planters. This passage about being plucked from the top and set out or planted wouldn't have sparked any interest from most planters because they just aren't being broken off from the top of a large tree, if you understand the metaphor. Listen, I had the dream job in the dream church. I was the pastor of a growing, vibrant church of about 500, and we were rocking it. Wonderful people, by the way. Still love those people. I had no enemies that I knew of, no no real problems. Things were absolutely sweet. The Sunday before I resigned, we baptized 17 people in one day. The church had seven full-time staff members, counting myself. We even had an amazing new building that would require probably about $15 million to build in Ridgefield. It was a big cedar, okay? And don't take this wrong, but in a sense, I was the topmost branch. I mean, I was the lead pastor. Don't worry, that's not a claim about prominence or importance. But I'm saying that as Christy and I were reading this, God used these words 
about the topmost branch to help us see that he was saying something about what we were right in the middle of doing, or rather, what God was in the middle of doing through us. And see, that's the most important thing in the promise of the text. Who would be doing this? Who would be getting this done? Who would make sure this was accomplished? The Lord God of Israel, Yahweh, the one true God, was going to set us out, and he was going to do the planting. Now, how is my application, or what I believed God was saying to me personally, in line with the original intent of the passage? Well, it was originally about the church and the head shepherd of the church, which, make no mistake, is Jesus Christ. But as a pastor, what am I? I'm the shepherd and leader of one specific local church. So I'm the shepherd and leader of this specific church being planted. Jesus is the shepherd and leader of the original and universal church, which was also planted. The passage in Ezekiel is about the original church plant. And by the Spirit, we were led to take this passage to mean something specific about our church plant. I believe God still says specific things to specific people through His Word. Let's look at the next line in the text. I will pluck from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one, and I will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the high mountain of Israel, I will plant it. So, what does this mean universally? Universally, that God will plant His church in Jerusalem. The high mountain of Israel is a reference to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And let me ask you to remember what happened in that place 10 days after Jesus ascended into heaven. Can you remember? When was the church of Jesus Christ launched? There, there, there's a distinct answer to that question. It's not iffy. There was a crystal clear launch of the church of Jesus Christ. When was that? Pentecost. The word means 50th day. 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, the Holy Spirit came down and the first church was planted. By the way, they started with a church service which is good for some deconstructionist types to remember. And they all sat and listened while Peter preached a sermon through which 3,000 Jews were saved by faith in Christ, being baptized immediately right there at the temple. Pentecost was the awesome and glorious launch of the first church plant, the church of Jerusalem, which quickly began to multiply throughout the known world. And where exactly did this glorious launch of the church occur? In the temple courtyard on what is called the Temple Mount in the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. Ezekiel called it perfectly hundreds of years before it happened. What about this imagery-filled word used here, plant? God said, I will plant it. What is implied in the action of planting? It is implied that whatever this thing is, it is going to start small, but it is going to grow and reproduce or multiply. And so whatever happens there in Jerusalem on the mountain of Israel will only be the beginning. Isn't it amazing that God revealed his plan to Ezekiel way back in exile in Babylon at a time when they weren't even sure they'd ever get back to Jerusalem to start with? And by the way, did they think this prophecy was fulfilled by the remnant when they did get back to Jerusalem not much later? Probably. They probably thought that, yes. But now we can see that the ultimate meaning of this prophecy was clearly fulfilled when the root of Jesse, the branch of the Lord, the grapevine, the topmost twig of the cedar when Jesus Christ launched his church on the day of Pentecost. See, the church, the body of Christ, is Ezekiel's flourishing cedar, which grew from the twig, having been planted in Jerusalem. And 2,000 years later, this same church consists of some one billion living souls. All right, so how did we apply this portion of the text? How did we take it to heart in relation to our church plant. We took it as a promise that God will send young families to plant Go Church in a highly strategic location. Now, when I saw the word young in the text and took it as a description of what would be the core team of our church plant, I first thought of the four or five young couples who I believed would be involved. And that absolutely happened. They are still here. However, I wondered about some of the older folks who were also joining our team. One of the neat things God did in this church plan is to make it multi-generational to the fullest extent. 
I mean, every single generation currently living is well represented at Go Church. How cool is that? It's a wonderfully healthy and biblical thing, by the way. And I must say, it's extremely rare to see that happen in a church plant. So what about this idea of the twig being young? Well, recently I took a look at this word in the Hebrew and found that it can also mean new. The idea in context is actually something along the lines of fresh. In other words, these would be people who would not be characterized as old wineskins. Remember, Jesus said nobody puts new wine in old wineskins or else they will burst and be ruined and you'll lose the wine. No, ours were people who were ready to do something new. Regardless of their age, they were not overly concerned with tradition. In fact, these particular people had arrived at a point in life where their heart's cry was to be a part of a fresh work of God. Friends, I think that turned out to be absolutely true of every single person who joined our team. Now, what about this idea that our plant would take place in a highly strategic location. See, Jerusalem was obviously such a place. But what about Ridgefield? I submit to you that there is no more strategic location to plant a church in the entire Pacific Northwest, or perhaps in the entire United States. Ridgefield is the fastest growing city in the state of Washington, and we are situated on the doorstep of one of the most unreached cities in America. That's why God called us here. He knows what He's doing. And when I say strategic, I mean something more than just how well we might do for ourselves. I mean something beyond this church plant. I'm talking about something strategic for the kingdom of God. Just like the plant in Jerusalem, this plant is not mostly about us. I'll be talking more about multiplication in a moment, but let me say now that God gave me a word one day, and that word was beachhead. I was driving along in my truck, gazing at some of the construction in Ridgeville, and I simply heard the word beachhead in my mind. I began to think about what it could mean. And I'll tell you where I landed. I have come to believe that Ridgefield is a perfect place to set up a beachhead for the advancement of the kingdom of God into the Pacific Northwest. What is a beachhead? Let me read a definition. Here's the way Wikipedia puts it. A beachhead is a temporary line created when a military unit reaches a landing beach by sea and begins to defend the area while other reinforcements help out until a unit large enough to begin advancing has arrived. (laughs) I think you can see how this applies to the idea of Go Church being planted in a location as strategic as Ridgefield. By the way, I'm believing that we will see growth like we've never experienced after we get back into our gathering place. Reinforcements and new recruits are coming. And see, that will allow us to advance the kingdom sooner rather than later. But maybe you would resonate with a business version better than a military version of this concept. In business, there is something called the beachhead strategy. And here's how one website explained it. In business, the idea of a beachhead is to focus your resources on a small market area, such as a product category or smaller market segment, to turn it into a stronghold before advancing to the broader market or product categories. Now, I'm not really a business guy, and so I did not know that before, but when God gave me the idea of a beachhead, He knew I was going to Google it, and, and I would find out, I would, I would I'd be going, wow, this is pretty much exactly what we're doing. Thankfully, God is guiding me because I'm really not that smart as to plan all of this out. But all of this is there in the Ezekiel passage, which we believe God gave us to say, this is what I am going to do. It's also interesting to note that while we're not literally located on top of what we would call a mountain, neither was Jerusalem, but more like what we would call a hill, a holy hill, which is high and lifted up in the sense that God had set it apart. And guess what? Ridgefield is definitely on a hill, or what someone decided to call a ridge. So, you know, God just takes care of everything, doesn't he? Let's read on. And see how God makes a promise about this fresh, vibrant, thriving cedar, which is the church. He says that it may bring forth boughs, branches, and bear fruit, seed. Several other translations use the word branches here rather than boughs, and some use seed rather than fruit. It's the same thing, but imagery-wise, branches and seeds work a little better for our understanding because God definitely is talking about multiplication. 
The idea of these Hebrew words has to do with branching out and reproducing, or what we would call church planting multiplication. So what was the original intent? Universally, God is going to multiply the church of Jesus Christ outward from Jerusalem. This speaks for itself. We know what happened. The book of Acts tells us the story of church planting that resulted in the multiplication of the kingdom of God through the new churches being started, churches planting churches, planting churches, and so on. Every church that exists today can trace its roots back to the first church born on Pentecost. Only because of multiplication does any church exist. So how do we see Go Church fitting in to this vision? Specifically, that God will multiply Go Church so that many more churches will be planted. We're going to have branches, folks. We are going to plant seeds. These branches and seeds will become trees, which will multiply as well. I have a goal of facilitating the planting of 50 churches by 2050, all of which will trace their lineage back to Go Church Ridgefield. That's where it will have all begun. I'm personally training up planters as we speak. I'm, I'm looking for, for current planters, people who are already ready, who would feel led to come under our vision also. In fact, there are already two planters trying to get here as soon as they can in order to be sent out from us to plant churches not far from here. Now, everything is taking longer than I wanted, but that's just because I am very, very impatient. Our church is 1.5 years old. God, knew, God knows we probably haven't quite been ready yet, but multiplication is coming. By the way, there's a name and a vision behind what I'm referring to right now. It's called the Go Church Family Network, or GoNet for short. I've been working hard to develop this from day one. The next church plant for which I have a committed planter and a clear timeline is Go Church PDX. His family plans to move here roughly one year from now. And some of you may need to pray about being a part of this core team to plant a Go Church in Portland. We're headed through the black gates, people. <laughs> I'm sorry, Portlandia, you know, I'm, I'm only joking, sort of, you know, don't worry, someone who understands you better and has more grace than me will be the planter for, for the Portland branch. He, he, he will understand that and be able to get in there and do what needs to be done in Portland. Now, I could talk about this network all day. Nothing excites me more. And the point is that we're not trying to become a mega church here in Ridgefield. We're trying to exponentially multiply churches to advance the kingdom of God in a way that just beats the heck out of just growing one church bigger and bigger and bigger. But before I go on and on about my favorite topic, I better stop there. Let's look at the next phrase. <clears throat> God says this about the tree, and it will become a stately cedar. So what does this word stately mean in the original Hebrew? Well, it means stately, right? Or otherwise they wouldn't have used the word in the translation. But I did look it up. And another word that many translations use is majestic. Additionally, there's a definite connotation of width or height. In, in other words, this can be a reference to size. So what does God mean about the church universally here? He means the church of Jesus Christ will be massive and majestic. We've certainly seen that to be the case. From Jerusalem, the church has now spread its majestic branches all across the globe. The church of Jesus Christ, for all its human flaws, has truly been a majestic thing to behold throughout history. And for the record, at this time, the church or Christianity is considered the largest religion on earth. The point is that this prophecy that the church would become like a stately or massive or majestic cedar has certainly come true. So, how did I take this in regard to Go Church? I took it like this. Go Church Ridgefield will be big enough to multiply effectively. So in other words, we're not going to try to plant 50 churches from a position of weakness but rather from a position of strength. This plays out in real ways, such as the need to raise money and, and buy land and build a building so that we can have a more permanent place to grow strong and actually multiply churches across the Northwest. We aren't trying to build a mega church, but I do believe God is saying we will grow large enough to multiply effectively. Let me put it this way. Strong branches grow on strong trees. We could also say healthy branches grow on healthy trees. Let's move on. Next, God says, <clears throat> and birds of every kind will nest under it. They will nest in the shade of its branches. This is one of my favorite parts of the promise. What is God saying about the church as a whole? What does he mean by birds of every kind? Isn't it obvious? He's saying the church of Jesus Christ will be made up of every tribe and tongue. 
I'm sure most of you know that throughout the Bible this very thing is promised. God knew all along that His people were not only those physically descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but actually would be made up of all who would put their faith in His Messiah. God knew His people would cover the globe and consist of every ethnicity on earth. Jesus said, go to every nation. And he did not mean anything about geographical boundary lines. The words in the Greek are panta, ta, ethne, and it means all ethnicities or all people groups. My daughter Tori is making disciples among the Oaxaqueño people in southern Mexico, and her team is working specifically with the Zapotec people who live fairly isolated lives in mountain villages. God called her there to reach those people because he has a vision to bring into his church human beings from every ethnicity and from every part of the globe, even to the remotest parts of the earth. This is why we strongly support missions around the world. But what about Go Church? How does this apply? Here it is. Go Church will multiply churches to reach ethnic groups of many kinds. When I first read this part of the promise in Ezekiel 17, I felt a little sad because it didn't seem like this could really happen in Ridgefield. Birds of every kind. I thought, you know, I've studied the demographics here, and even though there are a few other ethnicities, Ridgefield is just about as white as any place in America. And I wasn't really happy about it because I'm pretty crazy about international people. I just think people from other cultures are super neat. And I was wishing a few more lived here. But then I noticed something in the promise. These birds of every kind nest under the shadow of the branches. You see that? And so I realized that God is promising that some of our other plants will be able to reach other ethnicities better than we can. I also came to believe God was saying we would plant some churches specifically designed to reach other ethnicities. I already have the logo for our first Go Iglesia. <laughs> Hopefully there'll be more than one. By the way, uh, my Hispanic planter friends tell me the Spanglish there is actually a good idea. I also dream about an international church in Portland or Seattle that would be made up of a mosaic of cultures. I believe God is saying to us through this text in Ezekiel that Go Church will send out branches or plant churches to reach ethnic groups of many kinds. How beautiful is this thought? I so love the plan which God has revealed. Next, God says this, All the trees of the field will know that I am the Lord. For the church as a whole, this means that God causes his church to thrive in order to make himself known. God does all of this first and foremost to bring glory to his name, to make himself known. This is important to understand because it is the primary difference between us and God. He exists for himself. We do not exist for ourselves, but rather for him. I know it can sound weird, but there's only one God and we are not him. To some extent, we can say that God's glory is the only pure motive. Even our love ultimately serves to bring glory to God. He made all things and they're all for, me, all for Him. That includes the church. We exist to make Him known and He causes us to thrive in order to make Himself known. And so since we believe God also brought us to this passage to encourage us, we take it to mean specifically this. God will cause Go Church to thrive in order to make Himself known. We're not trying to build our own kingdom here. Everything we do to bring glory to Go Church uh, will be burned up in the last day if, it, if it's not already forgotten. Trying to build a church out of pride or to impress people is as vain as trying to take your earthly treasure to heaven. You can't do it. We are in this for, for the glory of God, and I constantly ask Him to remove my false motives when they creep in. Part of why we can trust God to perform all of these promises is that He exists to glorify Himself, and our church is His body the body of Christ. Since God lives to magnify himself, he will magnify his church, particularly as his church magnifies him. Now look further in the text and take this next part in light of everything that's going on in our world. This is where it gets interesting, okay? Think about this in light of everything going on in our world right now. God says this, I bring down the high tree, exalt the low tree, dry up the green tree, then make the dry tree flourish. When the times call for quick turns, it is better to be a battleship than an aircraft carrier. When the storms are raging, it is better to be a sapling than a full-grown tree. When God brings discipline, 
it is better to know that you are dry than to think that you are green. When God wants you to grow, it is better to have not yet arrived at your full potential. When God is doing new things, it is better to be a church plant than a large established church. God is about to do a new work. Our world will never be the same after this pandemic is over. Some people and some churches who seemed strong before will fall. Some people and some churches who seem green will be dried up. James 4.10 says, Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you. Go Church is still small. We're still new. We're a blip on the radar screen of churches, even in our immediate area. But I believe a shaking is coming and has come. And before it is over, some who are first will be last, and some who are last will be first. God is shaking this earth. Who will come out stronger and who will not come out at all? I believe those who humbly and desperately seek the Lord in this time will come out stronger. And, and this is how I have led you. <clears throat> We must acknowledge our desperation for God in these trying times. We must humble ourselves and seek His face and turn from our wicked ways. He is our only hope, and yet our hope is secure in Him. When circumstances would seem to put an end to us, we will have a chance to see what God can do. What do these words <clears throat> from Ezekiel mean for the church as a whole? God says, I bring down the high tree, exalt the low tree, dry up the green tree, and make the dry tree flourish. What does this mean for the church universally? I would put it like this. In His timing, which seems to be right about now, God will lift up humble churches and bring down proud churches. And now I want to tell you about my wife's dream. <clears throat> Second. <clears throat> I do believe God still speaks in dreams. Now you have to be careful. Dreams are tricky and most are probably not from God. Never think of a dream on the level of Scripture, not even close. We must hold on to dreams loosely, even if we think it was from God, because we simply cannot know for sure whether it was God or if it was the pepperoni pizza we ate at midnight. All joking aside, I have personally experienced a grand total of three dreams in my life that I believe were from God. I won't be sharing any of those today, but my wife had a recurring dream for several nights right before the pandemic hit. And I believe it may well have been prophetic. Here's the gist of it. Christy dreamed that she saw, not too far away, a stand of evergreen trees, possibly firs or cedars, and then back behind them a few taller trees which were giant redwoods. But she noticed that those larger redwoods were dried up and dead. Everything begins to quake and shake, and it appears that the smaller stand of trees will be sucked down into a sinkhole. But then the larger redwoods be behind them begin to be launched into the sky like sticks. She's aware that God is casting the larger trees away. After the shaking, the smaller stand of cedars or firs has somehow remained, though it looked at one point as if they would not make it. Now, I don't know if the interpretation of that dream seems as obvious to you as it did to me. But the way I took it is that there is going to be a shaking. And hasn't there been? No, Christy is not psychic. But I do believe God gave her a dream. And by the way, God shaking the earth is a theme throughout Scripture. And after a shaking from God, some things fall and other things stand. So when I put Christie's dream together with Ezekiel 17, 22 through 24, what did I get? I got the idea that some larger churches or ministries or perhaps even denominations 
may not come out as well after all this shaking, while other churches or ministries will come out stronger than ever. God is shaking and pruning His church, friends. Where will go, church? Come out. Thankfully, God had already given us a promise long before Christie's dream and long before this current crisis. He said, I bring down the high tree, exalt the low tree, dry up the green tree, and make the dry tree flourish. I already told you what I think it means universally, and this is how he took it specifically. That as we humble ourselves, God will exalt Go Church and cause it to thrive. Oh, how I know that only God can do it. Let me be clear that we are no better than any other church because we are people just like every other church. Only God can do a work to exalt this church for His glory, to help us thrive for His purposes. And obviously, I hope every church is made to thrive. But the fact is, some who appear alive are dead, and some who are dead can be made alive. God is going to show us that He is in control. I do think... The Lord meant to say something to us with this, and I think He meant that we won't be like the old dried-up redwoods in Christie's dream, however tall or large they may be, that we won't be cast aside as some of them may be, just as the churches in Revelation were in danger of being cut off. But most importantly, that our church, your church, will be revived through this time of trial, and that as a result, we will be exalted and made to thrive by God Himself, the only one who can do it. Let me hasten to make sure you don't think I'm saying anything about any specific church near here. I am not. I greatly appreciate those churches, actually. There are some truly amazing larger churches not far from here. I'm not insinuating anything about them. The point is that God is shaking things up. And I don't know what's going to stand and what is going to fall. But I do think some big, prominent churches or ministries may fall. And I think that some smaller, more humble churches will be exalted. To that point, let me say that I believe in my spirit that Go Church is headed for revival. And that hopefully many churches are headed for revival. I believe this is God's end game with all of this difficulty and even specifically with this season of not being able to gather for church. I believe prayer and repentance will lead some of our churches into revival, and hopefully that will lead to awakening for our land. And since I believe this is what God is doing, I'm endeavoring to make myself useful to Him and do everything I can to help bring these things about, which is the reason I have called our church to a 40-day prayer challenge, asking you to pray like you have never prayed before. If circumstances like these will not drive us to our knees, perhaps there is no hope. But I believe in you, church family. I believe you are hitting your knees. And I've already heard many stories that give me reason to feel positive about our future. God is going to do great things from out of this difficult time. I so believe that the next several years of our fruitfulness as a church are being set up by this time of faithfulness and prayer together. Now is our time. Now is our chance. I beg you to turn your hearts to Christ and pray like never before. Let's look at the final words of our text. Yahweh says, I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will perform it. When it comes to the church as a whole, he certainly has performed it. He has spread the word of the gospel across the globe, multiplying the church until disciples are made every day in the thousands. Sometimes we don't see this as clearly in our own country. But the church of Jesus Christ has never multiplied more quickly than it is multiplying in these last days. Our Lord has indeed performed the things which He said He would perform all the way back in the time of Ezekiel. Christy and I also believe that God is promising to do a work in and through Go Church. We believe He's promising to do great things, some of which I've mentioned today. He will perform it. And He will do so for two reasons, for His glory and because of love. He loves us. And He loves the people of our community and our world. Our Lord is not willing that any should perish, but wishes that all would come to repentance. He wants to bless us, and He wants to bless our efforts as a church. He has spoken, and He will perform it. It's so incredibly good to be in the center of the will of God. Now, as I wrap up, I want to say a word to those who are not part of any church currently. If you live within 30 miles, join us. Join our mission. Now is the time. 
If you're more than 10 miles away, there's a good chance we'll eventually plant a church near you. And you can be a part of that team when the time comes. But come and join us now so we can send you out later. Even more importantly, I want to end with an appeal to those who are not sure they have trusted in Christ. He died for you. He loves you. He wants you on his team. I said people are becoming disciples of Jesus by the thousands every day all over the world, and that is true. By the tens of thousands, actually, especially in places like Iran and China and Cuba. But what about you? Did you grow up in an American culture where it was either assumed that you're probably already a Christian or else nobody ever told you that God awaits your decision? Jesus did not automatically save everyone, my friend. He died for everyone. His gift is offered to everyone. But have you received it? And have you surrendered your life to Him? Because there's no way you can really believe God came and died for you and received that gift without wanting to give Him back your life. It's a package deal. You need to accept God's gift in Christ and offer Him your life in return. Jesus loves you. And He has a dream for your life. Is anyone ready? From your living room or wherever you're watching to surrender to Jesus today. Is, is there anyone? All of us who know him had that day. We had that moment. I was six years old. Most people are a little older. I still remember understanding I was not okay with God. There was sin in my life. Even as a six-year-old, I knew there was, there was, a, there was a guilt. There was a, there was a knowledge. And because of my parents and a pastor, I, I understood. I had heard the word, the gospel, that there was a Savior, that I could be at peace with God. And I got on my knees and surrendered to that Savior. And He saved me. My life's never been the, the same. I, that began a journey that I continue to walk out. Has that ever happened for you? Has there ever been that moment? It can be today. It doesn't matter. It's your living room. It doesn't matter. We're talking about your eternity that's at stake. Not only that, but your life, the rest of your life here and how you could serve the Lord who made you instead of just living for yourself. Would you just bow with me wherever you are? And if you're ready to say yes to Jesus, just tell him. It's not a magic prayer. It's not magic words. Just tell him. Just say yes. Forgive me. Come into my life. I, I, give, you, I give you my life. I, I need you. Words like that that say, I surrender. I need a Savior. I believe he's Jesus. Save me. Jesus, I'm crying out to you. Show me how to live for you. In his name, amen. I hope you just keep thinking about what God has said as Connor uh, and, and, and the rest of us lead in a, in a closing song. And think about the words. And, and the fact that God is in control, none of this surprised him. He's on his throne. He's worthy. He is worthy of our lives. We can get through anything. We have hope in him. Our eternity is secure. This world is not our home. This is not it. Turn your heart to him as Connor sings. same God who never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out oh yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley yes I will 
will bless your name Oh yes, I will sing for joy When my heart is heavy in all my days Oh yes, I will same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I Bless your name Oh yes, I will sing for joy When my heart is heavy in all my days Oh yes, I will for all my days Yes, I will and I choose to praise To glorify, glorify the name